welcome and thank you so much to all of you that have joined us today for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We are talking about what makes a good leader, and we are having this conversation with Dr. Rob Harder, Executive Director, um, and he also has a podcast, and uh, we're going to learn more about that from, from Rob here shortly. Before we do that, we, of course, want to make sure if we haven't met, you know who the heck we are. Julia Patrick is the CEO of the American American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom. I get to be her her fun sidekick, and it's always a pleasure to be alongside Julia. I'm also known as your nonprofit nerd and CEO of the Raven Group, and we would not be having these conversations if we did not have the continued support and investment from these presenting sponsors. And we're not talking about the investment only here for the nonprofit show, but truly in your community, in your sector, and really to help you drive your mission-driven goals forward. These organizations exist to help you do more good. They are in your community. They're online. If you have not checked them out, please do, because they are literally here in your corner and on your team to help you do more good in your local and geographic community. So thank you to our presenting sponsors. And thank you again to Dr. Rob Harder, who has joined us. Uh, We were just sharing in the Chitty Chat chat, those of you that joined us for the Green Room tra- Chatter, um, I, it's been about a year, Rob, since you joined us. So welcome back. Oh, it's great to be back. Thank you so much for having me. It's been, a lot has happened in a year. Well, you know, that's why we really uh, wanted to have you come back on because we thought, wow, you've seen so many different things. You're a community leader, you're a nonprofit leader, you're involved in the faith community. And we really are struggling, it seems like, with these conversations about leadership. And and we have seen, as you have, this great resignation bloom where we're losing our leaders through retirement, aging out, compassion fatigue, you name it. And so there's so much going on. And so we thought, wow, let's start to have this conversation with Rob and see what he's seeing um, and so that we can kind of shed some light on it. So I got to start with, with the first question, and that is, are nonprofit leaders the same or as good or as bad or as difficult or as what <laughs> as for profit? I mean, it's a good question. Uh, it's a and really good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my first response to that question is that leaders are leaders, uh, regardless of the sector nonprofit, for profit, government. Leaders are leaders. So if you're a good leader in one setting, you most likely will be a good leader in another setting. Okay. Now, having said that, I think the nonprofit sector, there are a couple of challenges, I guess, uh, that are unique to the nonprofit uh, sector that maybe do are different than, say, we'll just say for the sake of argument, the for-profit sector. And here's what I would say, at least three areas where I feel like the nonprofit sector is a bit uh, different that the leadership has to be applied correctly. And that would be number one, uh, scalability. Um, a lot of times nonprofits, the need for food or for rent assistance or housing or health care that a lot of nonprofits will seek to meet, which over COVID was a big deal for us, I know, and many other nonprofits across the country. We just, you, you have this need, and ironically for nonprofits, a lot of the need rose during a crisis, but the resources didn't necessarily rise with it. Now, hopefully you did get more maybe donations this last year than you had before because people were responding to the COVID crisis and were wanting to get behind your nonprofit to help serve the people that you were serving. But for some, they didn't. And so the need rose, but then the resource didn't rise with it. So therefore, it was difficult to scale the nonprofit organization. I think in a for-profit, typically you have a little bit more money to work with or you could sell more widgets, so to speak, and you can scale more easily. You can go get some more investment money from a venture capital company. Um, It's different in the nonprofit world. You really have to continue to maximize your fundraising. So I think that makes it a bit difficult, um, that leadership maybe in that sense is a bit more challenging. And then along those lines, I've heard this, I'm sure you've had people on the show talk about this, is with resources then is this idea that right now one of the biggest challenges in the nonprofit sector is competing with the for-profit sector when it comes to pay rates. Um, we've just seen in our community here in Park City where you know you have uh, a couple of fast food restaurants that are paying anybody with zero experience $18 an hour sometimes just 
because they can't get anybody to work there and they need to raise the minimum wage to $18 an hour to, with no experience. So you could be a high school kid. Uh, so great for high school kids right now. You can pick your job and get paid pretty well with no experience. And so that's difficult because, again, a company has a few more resources to throw at you know, um, salaries that nonprofits can't initially turn that quickly when it comes to pay rates. Um, so that's a challenge, I think, that is a little bit different when it comes to the leadership you know, challenge for uh, nonprofits versus for profit. And then the last one would just be, I think this constant, this is always a, a challenge, is to maximize volunteers. Nonprofits are set up to really invest in and lean on volunteers. And sometimes that can be a challenging thing to do. So in other words, you can't just scale up or grow your nonprofit by just hiring more and more people because typically don't have the resources or the budget to do that. Well, that's where volunteers come in. So making sure as a leader, like in a for-profit business, you may think, well, I've got to continue to hire if I'm going to grow and scale this business. I'm going to keep hiring people or get more investment money and go hire more people after that. You can't do that in a nonprofit. It's different in terms of how you manage your budget. So therefore, you're investing more in volunteers and then your leadership's changing. Now, on the positive side, I think for nonprofits, there's a lot of volunteers out there that really want to make a difference. And the beauty of that is they're helping you out for the mission that you're all about. And so there's a draw to your nonprofit. It's not about the paycheck. It's about, I would do this if I wasn't paid because I love your mission. And so in many ways, nonprofit leadership really is about inspiring people uh, to the mission of what you're trying to accomplish versus just throwing out money to say, hey, let me just pay you more to get you to work at my business. So those are a few things that jumped to my mind with that question. Wow, that was a lot of information. And there's so many pieces in that that I would I would love to dig into. Um, I, I really held on to something, uh, Julia, that you actually brought up and, and Rob just brought up is really this economy change and how, you know, for us as nonprofit leaders, for us to either attract or retain some of our staff, it's really looking at that 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 wage structure and looking at the pay. And you're right, Rob, like for profits, we can sell more widgets or we can really look at increasing our bottom line in that way and in that capacity, but we don't necessarily have that ability in our nonprofit, you know, business model. But what you also said was that volunteer workforce. And that I think is hitting a home run because that is what sets the nonprofit sector apart from the for-profit sector is we may not be able to meet those wage salaries or, you know, to, to up that, to even meet what some of these fast food restaurants are paying here in our community. It's about $20 an hour. Right. And it's, fascinating. Higher, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's fascinating. And so really looking at, okay, how do we tap into that volunteer workforce? You know, it's so interesting that you would say that I, I was uh, at a, doing an event online last night with a very prominent a global leader in human services. And um, I was really, I knew we were coming on with Rob today. And so I was thinking about leadership as I was watching this. And I realized that this leader really was almost um, an evangelist for the concept and the mission to such an extent that by the time I was done with, with watching this program, I just had to have more. I wanted to be a part of it. And it was not a recruiting tool for volunteers. It wasn't even a recruiting tool for fundraising, but he did such a good job. He did elicit my desire to help and to participate. And, yeah. and that, that's a, a total leadership issue. Whether he knew it or not, it wasn't contrived. But I'm thinking about that, Rob, because when you are a leader for something that is so emotional, it seems to me that you're going to have different personality traits. Maybe not. And I'd love to get your take on that. Like, what does that look like? If you're a raw, raw leader in the for-profit, is that going to work better or worse? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, th- there's so much debate about that. And, you know, my podcast show, we've, I've asked that same question many, many times. And you know, it really depends on who you ask, but the general sense that I get uh, from leaders and, and authors that I read and leaders who have done this well is that you, there are certain traits that are common to, uh, say, executive directors or CEOs of nonprofit organizations. They tend to be 
not always, again, tend to be more extroverted, for example. They tend to be a little bit more of the passionate, rah-rah, you know, leaders that can generate people to be excited about the organization and get rally around a cause. But you don't have to be. And so uh, some of the people I feel like have really given me new insight is that self-awareness is probably the most important part of a leader. And in fact, they've done a recent study, I think it was Harvard Business School that did a study about what's the most important part of leadership. It was self-awareness, meaning if you know the type of leader you are, and say you're an introvert, and you're like, I don't know if I can really be an executive director or a top leader at a nonprofit. If you're an introvert, uh, or because you're an introvert, um, that's not necessarily the case. It's just how do you lead through your introvertedness, and who do you rally around you on your team so that the certain things that maybe you're not good at, you're not wired to do, you have other people on your team that will do that. So you don't have to be everything to everybody. You don't have to be that robber all the time, but you need someone who's exciting, getting people excited. Maybe it's your director program. Maybe it's your COO. So you, as long as you're aware of what your leadership strengths and weaknesses are, and you rally other gifts around you, and you have the humility to allow other people to lead with you, I think you could still be a successful leader in the nonprofit world. So I'm careful to, I used to be a little bit more like, yes, this is the personality trait, but the more I've been in leadership and the more I've learned from other leaders that have done it much, you know, big, bigger situations than me and larger organizations, it does seem like that there's a lot of variety of leaders out there. The key is, do you know what kind of leader you are and what kind of leadership team have you developed? That's going to be the most important part about you being a good leader and your organization being well-led. This makes me think of, the plethora of personality tests that are out there, right? I mean, there are so many personality tests. I was sitting around um, a a client's, you know, board table the other week, and they were talking about, you know, all of the staff makeup and how this person is really, you know, um, the the empath, this one's the driver, this one's the worker, you know, and just like how all of these pieces of personality traits come together to really build that solid foundation of a team. And I love what you said, Rob, is that like you yourself as the leader of the organization, you may not have to be that total extrovert, but to build your team with strengths um, that surrounds you to make up this truly robust team. I think I agree. That's the key. You know, it's really building your team with these solid personality traits to provide the leadership across the board, because I think we talk about the leader at the top, but there's leaders in every level. There's leaders in every, I believe, every person. Um, And so how that shows up in the day-to-day operation as you serve your community plays a big piece of your organization's success. No, couldn't agree more. Rob, what are you seeing about that? I mean, when we talk about leadership, I think the discussion's changing. I mean, just for you to to bring up the concept of being self-aware and being um, other or not the same as everyone else in the room is not the way we've talked about leadership for many, for decades. So what are you seeing as we move forward in terms of, um, is this better for the recruitment of more talent or is this, you know, what is this doing? Because it's kind of a shakeup. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, I think it's a couple of things. I think it's being aware that there's not a cookie cutter model for leadership. I think that was the case for, I think that felt the case that this is, here's your uh, typical leader and this is the type of person you want to be. And then I think a couple of things happen. Again, this is what I've read and observed. So it's not uh, just from me, uh, my experience um, is that there were leaders out there that didn't have the typical, you know, leadership style that everyone would say, oh, that's a leader. And yet they built big businesses or they did an amazing job with their company or their nonprofit. They're like, okay, people start scratching their heads. Well, maybe there's different types of leadership out there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big piece of it is that just by people going out there and leading their own way, um, people couldn't deny the fact that there were some successful leaders that were different than they initially maybe thought. Um, I also think this openness to diversity, uh, which is, I think is a wonderful thing. I know again, we, uh, I think all of us are having those conversations about diversity and inclusion and equity. And so I think it's broadening our mind in general about what are we missing when it comes to leaders? I think diversity is a piece of that, but it's not just diversity in terms of background and race and ethnicity, but it's leadership styles too. I think there needs to be a diversity in that and more voices at the table that maybe there's some unsung leadership traits that we've not highlighted enough in the past that people are realizing, no, those are actually really important traits too, and people can lead with those strengths 
that maybe weren't always honored. And um, so that would be my initial thought. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah, that is fascinating. One of the things I remember hearing is, you know, shepherds lead their flock from the middle, right? Not necessarily from the front or from the back, but truly shepherds lead their flock from the middle. And that is a leadership style that um, I think is, is fascinating. So it, it takes me to the board and I'm curious how the makeup of the board and the leaders that make up the board, how they play a role in this leadership um, time in, when it's so critical. I mean, everyone's talking about these last 18 months. It's really been a toll. It's really been challenging for so many of us. And um, I'm curious, Rob, what you've seen with this makeup of the board and how they play a role in this. Yeah, you're right. It's been, I think, a very challenging time for the last 18 months. And I think it's um, revealed a little bit, right? If there were tensions that were maybe under the surface, they came way out in the open. So if there was tension with your board, it really was out there. If there was tension in your staff, it got out there, right? So I think we all experienced that. You know, I'm personally very lucky. I have an amazing board. I really do. Uh, they're incredible. And I think a lot of it's because they're leaders. They're good leaders. And when they're, you have a board full of good leaders, then they understand leadership. And so they understand what the organization needs. And so I think good communication is so important between the board, particularly the board chairman, the board chair uh, person, and the executive director or CEO. But just in general, just good communication with the board and engagement by the board. I think it is really, really important that the board is supportive of the staff and, again, specifically the executive director because that's a typical um, connection point. Because when if the executive director is feeling stress and the organization is feeling a lot of stress, the board, in a perfect world, is that place where they're going to be in your corner, they're going to rally around you, they're going to encourage you, they're going to invest in you financially, right? And they're going to say, you can do this, what else can we do? Like, they're engaged and they're there as a support versus backing off and saying, well, hey, you know, we're the board, this is your job, you're getting paid to do this. Like, that's not a great board response, right? Because then you feel like you're not an island by yourself and you don't feel that support and so like again i i there's this incredible board where they have been engaged they've been checking in they're worried about not just the organization but they're worried about me and how am i doing how's my wife how's my kids um so that's a wonderful and an ideal world is board members that care that are engaged have good communication and again they're good leaders hopefully because that just goes from the board all the way through the organization and, and again a perfect world that's what you want you know, again, you hit the nail on the head when it comes to talking about the personal side of, of the person, um, because I think for so often, I know, I know I was trained, um, you know, many, many, many years ago that you leave all your problems at the door and you show up to work just with your work self and whatever's happening at home, whatever's happening personally. But I have seen that shift really as, as a society culturally in these last 18 months, that there is a lot more of that true altruistic, how are you? How is your wife? How are your children? Like, how is your entire family unit? You know, when we talk about this great resonation, I know here in our community, we have had so many CEOs resign, um, maybe because of, you know, burnout and, and fatigue. Um, and so really looking at that holistic leader, um, because a leader is a leader 24-7, and I know, you know, I can't turn that switch off. And so I'm curious what you've seen, how maybe this leadership conversation has changed to really encapsulate the entire person. I think you nailed it, um, Jared. I think that is something that has changed recently. I think it was already moving that direction. Like there were certain books out there about being the authentic leader and bringing your authentic self and your full self to work. But I think COVID really put it to another level. And I think it's a combination of you are working from home, you're in, you know, on a Zoom call and your dog was in the background or your kids come up and jump in your lap. Like that <laughs> blending of work and life was like never before. And so I think there was a sense of, as opposed to being all upset, like, oh my God, close the door. And, and, and you, you know, yelling at your kids on the Zoom, you're like, no, come on in and say hi to everybody on the Zoom call, right? There was just yeah. a sense of that's real life. Yeah. And I think that's been embraced now that yes, you are a full human being. And the more you can bring your full human being to work is better. I think it's more honored. It's funny because I, same thing, when I first was in leadership, there was a sense of a real separation between work and personal life. And you kind of really didn't talk about them much. And now there's much more of a blending of work-life balance, number one, and just bringing your whole life to work. And, and even to the point of having really um, 
making sure your staff have a good work-life balance, like having conversations about that and making sure that is honored in your organization versus, hey, we want you to give as many hours as you can to this organization because that's the goal. I think too many people burnt out with that and they're like, they're done with that. They don't want to, that's part of the great resignation. I think they realize, you know what? I actually kind of liked having a walk at night and with my wife and being home when I needed to be, um, I think I'm going to keep that going, you know, like, so they didn't want to go back to the old way maybe of working 60, 70 hours and, and not seeing their kids. And so I do think that's a change that just got pushed on steroids, if you will, because of COVID and all of us being at home and on Zoom so much more, it, it blended that more than ever, I think. Yeah. One of the things we've talked about um, and a questions question that we have asked is, you know, what has worked well for you during COVID that you will continue to carry on? And I do think this, this blend, this authentic leadership, but that takes me really to the future. And what do you think, Rob, um, has worked well for leaders and community members um, that might continue in this future? So this is kind of, you know, if, if you have this, you um, you know, crystal ball in, in your desk or on that shelf behind you, please grab it, look into this crystal ball and tell us exactly. <laughs> yes. Tell us what is the future of nonprofit leadership and, and just leaders in general. Yeah. And I think we already touched on that idea of just bringing your whole self to your job. I think that is something that's being honored and should be encouraged more and more uh, the leader that's more open to feedback, the leader that uh, is really, you know, more of a, a real person in a sense, not just this CEO that's removed from the rest of the staff or even, you know, donors and volunteers for that matter. So I think that's definitely a change. Uh, so, you know, again, bringing your whole self to work, hugely important. I do think also looking forward, I think, and this is, I think it is unique back to the kind of the earlier question about uniqueness of nonprofit leadership. I think nonprofits, one of the strengths of nonprofits are their nimbleness. You know, the ability to turn on a dime and, and adjust to a new need in the community or something else that's come up. And what I found, I think I maybe have shared this last time I was on the show, but I continue to see this. And I think this will definitely shape us into the future is that if your organization was able to adjust and be nimble enough to pivot during COVID and still operate and serve the needs that you had in front of you quickly and safely, then you, you, th you were thriving during COVID. If you yeah. were not able to address and you weren't nimble and you weren't able to pivot, you really struggled. And some people are really struggling. So I feel like that has changed. I don't think it's going back. I think nonprofits really need to be uh, the most nimble organizations around. And, and one example, it's a practical example is, you know, stressing with donors, please give us unrestricted gifts. Yes. The reason being is that as long as you trust the nonprofit, which you hope you do, you give an unrestricted gift and the organization can use that money, right, to where needed most. And things change, the needs change, and COVID just showed that in a big way. And so the more donors understand that, the more you can communicate the importance of that, the more then all of a sudden your budget is maybe not locked into these programs you have to continue, even though it's not relevant anymore. It's like, no, if it's unrestricted gifts, then you know you can use it where needed most, and that allows you to be more nimble and to apply those resources to the biggest needs that you're seeing. So I think that's a really, really big one. And then the second thing is innovation. I think that's in the future, nonprofits that are going to really thrive. I mean, I think this has always been the case, but I definitely think now, because there's so many things changing uh, on a, just a daily basis, it seems, in terms of the information that's out there, the technology that's out there. Here's just one small example that I still, I am very much unaware of how to do this exactly, but I've had two people on my show now, I've had a, I'll, I'll be coming out soon. A part, a part series on cryptocurrency and yes. how do you use cryptocurrency to for your nonprofit that more and more now it's very small but it's growing rapidly not just of course this is across the world but certainly in the nonprofit sector where people are giving money to nonprofits through cryptocurrency well i think most nonprofits are like what is cryptocurrency and how do i utilize it but i think we need to be innovative and find out is this something that we can look into is something should we look into it what are the different ramifications if we do accept cryptocurrency because it is unique it's not the typical check in the mail or even going online and just you know running your credit card so these two people on my show i was just fascinated because i learned so much about cryptocurrency that i didn't know and so i'm thinking okay i think this is just a symbol of being open to being innovative will be critical for the future because things are changing quickly. And if you want to stay ahead and not retract back, uh, I think you've got to be really, as a leader, open to innovation on a regular basis. At the same time, of course, keeping your core values, not, not you know, jettisoning your values, but keeping them, but always looking to the future. 
Well, we have we have that discussion. I think coming up next week. Um, I think we do too. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. yeah, because we we see. Yeah, I mean, in terms of a a forward thinking trend, love it or hate it. Uh, yeah. So we're we're having that discussion. I think next maybe Thursday. But yeah, absolutely. I think you're right. You know, Jarrett Ransom said something so interesting to me now, almost two years ago, and and she said, you know, the nonprofit sector is due for a disruption. Now, this was pre-COVID. Yeah. But she she made the comment, I remember where we were, and she said, you know, we've been doing things the same way, in some cases, more than 100 years. Um, we haven't done anything different, and we, we're getting left behind when we don't stretch and um, try new things and, and be innovative. And so I think in some ways, COVID has moved us forward and pushed us to places where we never thought we could go, and yet we're better for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I must I have so. had the crystal ball that day. <laughs> you did. Yeah, you you did. Go, Jared. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know. You know, we have been doing a shake um, for this shakeup and this disruption. And you know, I'm a, a huge believer in innovation and also benchmarking what other um, companies and sectors are doing in in many industries, right? Like not just the nonprofit industry. And I think we have so much to learn. And I think we really are stepping up to the plate in many many ways, wage included, as as you had mentioned, Rob. Like we have to really be competitive in our pay, um, but we also have the ability of a attracting that volunteer workforce that sets us apart in a very different manner. So I think, you know, nimbleness, I love that you brought that back up. Um, Innovation, if we can harness that and harness our authenticity to move us forward and to really continue to capture, you know, our community needs with, with those two elements, remain nimble, right? With your leadership, with your board, with your community, serve the community and and how they need to be served and be open to that innovation. So Rob Harder, thank you so much. Uh, We are so grateful that you spent your time with us today. And uh, for those of you that may not know Rob, um, he is, uh, which I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about your podcast, where we can find it. Um, But you also serve as the executive director of the Christian Center in Park City, Utah. So thank you so much, Rob. And yes, please let us know where we can hear more about your leadership podcast. Uh, well, thank you again for having me on the show. Thanks for these great questions. And for those who are watching and listening, uh, Julia and Jared, I always have good questions. So continue to watch their shows in the future because I think it's really, really good to dive into these deep topics, right? It's just what we're, it's going to help us become better leaders. And Nonprofit Leadership Podcast, yes, thanks for introducing me on that. It's been something I've loved to do. I have some great um, guests on the show. You can check it out anywhere, iTunes, Google, Amazon, uh, anywhere you can find podcasts. My podcast is up there. Um, but yeah, just you can actually Google Nonprofit Leadership Podcast and it should pop up. And that has been a really fun thing for me because I have grown so much as a leader just listening to these wonderful guests, uh, just like Julia and Jarrett do. And so thank you for the opportunity to share and I encourage any comments. If people have some ideas, comments, things they're learning, pass it on to all three of us. We'd love to learn what you are seeing in your neck of the woods. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. When this started, our conversations, the nonprofit show, uh, now almost two years, Julia promised me it would be a two week, you know, um, stint. And here we are coming up <laughs> literally on, on four years. episodes. But every day, every weekday, we are having conversations with leaders across the globe. It has, you know, leveled my information, my knowledge tremendously, exponentially, I cannot even measure it. Um, So I do, I I reap the benefits. I feel so privileged and blessed to have these conversations just like you do with your podcast, Rob. So thank you so much again for your your time and expertise. Julia Patrick, I'm so glad that you had this two week dream. And here we are going strong well into almost 2022. It'll be here before we know it. Um, And I'm Jarrett Ransom. Again, it's really fun to play alongside with Julia each and every day. We wouldn't be able to have these conversations uh, with our a very amazing guest like Dr. Rob Harder today with Christian Center Park City if it weren't for these presenting sponsors. So again, they exist for one sole purpose, and that is to help you do more good in your community. Please do find them and check them out. They are phenomenal. Hey, as we like to end every episode and truly mean it from our, our hearts, 
stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rob.